Good afternoon. I hope you guys all enjoyed your lunch. We've got a great session today, um, which will be discussing 800-53 privacy appendix, what it means and how this affects you. Um, we have two wonderful presenters here. I'm just going to give brief introductions to them. Jonathan Cantor is the Chief Privacy Officer and Director of Open Government at the Department of Commerce. As Chief Privacy Officer, he is responsible for privacy and data protection policy for the department and also serves as the key advisor on issues relating to privacy. Jonathan also leads the department's open government and transparency, transparency activities as well as its Freedom of Information Act and Federal Advisory Committee Act programs. Prior to Commerce, he worked at the Social Security Administration as the Executive Director for Privacy Disclosure in SSA's Office of the General Counsel. We also have Rowan Shaddix. She joined the FDIC Internal Privacy Program as a Senior Privacy Analyst in 2007. In this capacity, she works on a wide range of program policy, awareness, and compliance, compliance initiatives aimed at maintaining a culture of privacy throughout the corporation. She also serves as co-chair of the Best Practices Subcommittee of the Federal CIO Council Privacy Commi Committee. Sorry. <laughs> Prior to joining the FDIC, she served as a senior privacy consultant to the U.S. Department of Transportation's Privacy Program and worked on privacy initiatives at Transportation Security Administration and Defense Security Service. I also want to mention we had um, Thomas Boyce, who was supposed to be here today, unfortunately due to a family emergency, he won't be present. Um, but also I want you guys to know that this, this is intended to be a very interactive session. So our presenter, presenters are welcoming any questions, comments, anything like that. Feel free to chime in, jump in with any you know, curiosities you have or, or experiences that you, you've had as well. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Um, and let me re reiterate that intro point about um, interrupting us or asking questions. Please feel free to do that. Um, you know, with, with Tom not joining us today, we have a little bit of uh, flexibility in our presentation. And we want it to be interesting for you because we know as you know, this, the appendix and, and the whole issue is on privacy. Um, it may not be dead set um, right in the center of your, your areas of, of expertise or experience, and we want the, the presentation to be much more useful to you um, <clears throat> than it is to us. We already know this stuff. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll let you kind of kick off here and then I'll bounce it out. Okay. Please do. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for being here, and uh, as was said in the introduction, um, I serve as co-chair of the Best Practices Subcommittee of the Federal CIO Council Privacy Committee. And Jonathan is a new co-chair for the full Privacy Committee, so, uh, um, but also is formally uh, co-chair of the so. Innovation and Technology Subcommittee. So, which are you sub? Which are you co-chair of? It's here. <laughs> Um, we speaking to you later. That's right. Uh, so uh, the reason I mention that is because um, the, the work on this new Appendix J, which uh, for many years was just called the Draft Privacy Controls document, um, started out uh, first an initiative by NIST, and I'd like to acknowledge Ron Ross, who is here this afternoon. Um, uh, the, the initiative itself to develop this document started back in 2009. And uh, where Miss basically approached uh, my predecessor co-chairs at the time to see if uh, the privacy commu community would be interested in working with Miss to define some federal privacy requirements that could be applied across, you know, government-wide standards to be applied across the uh, the government, as well as across organizations, but also going down to the very, you know, uh, micro level to the system level, and. Um, and NIST had already been doing some work in this area, but realized and I think you know found that it would be useful to collaborate with the privacy community at the time. So of course the community jumped at the opportunity um, and saw this obviously as an incredibly important opportunity to be part of um, a publication 853 that is always the first thing you hear about. Like, you know, what are we gonna do with an initiative? What kind of controls are we gonna apply? Well, we know what to do in the security area, but what are we gonna do about privacy? And we know that, uh, we saw the opportunity that wherever 853 would go and the security controls would go, so would come the privacy controls. So um, our uh, process in the committee basically starts with a working group being tasked to try to develop whatever the de deliverable is and work on the task. 
And so at that time, we had to identify what would be a set, a standard set of controls that would apply across federal agencies. What is it that the chief privacy officer does on a day-to-day -day basis that we would want to um, document and embed in some type of uh, standard? And then, of course, that would be based on laws and regulations that exist today, but also looking at best practices that are out there. Um, so at the same time, though, because most of the people on the subcommittee and the working group are privacy people, we had to get our heads around the whole NIST arena. Come on in. Um, and uh, we had to understand, you know, what is a security control? What, how do you write something like that for the privacy community? Because most of us in privacy, um, when we talk about privacy within the privacy community, mm -hmm. we don't talk about controls. Mm -hmm. We yeah. talk about principles, you know, everything in privacy is around privacy principles and privacy policies. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very uh, different conceptual framework than most of the people within our community mm -hmm. um, are used to. And one of the goals um, from the get-go that, 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 you know, we, when we were created the partnership even with, with Ron was to kind of break down a lot of those barriers, both structurally and conceptually, um, exactly. to improve you know, the community dialogue back and forth between the two, kind of to demystify one another's world. Um, the idea that if we work together and spoke to each other in each other's languages, uh, you know, a little bit more naturally, you know, we'd be able to accomplish a lot more with a lot less friction. Um, you know, because our, our goals are often aligned. Mm -hmm. So so it really was that opportunity to, to kind of bridge that knowledge gap but we had to learn a lot about the NIST world, and uh, I've read more NIST publications now than I thought I ever would as a privacy person. Um, and I still have a lot to learn, but it, it really was an incredible opportunity. So we went through this process really through 2009 um, of, of trying to document what we knew today were requirements for privacy officials, and uh, and then trying to uh, put it in a, a way that, that would conform with the NIST way of doing things, but still be written with the privacy official in mind, because the, the Appendix J document, when you look at it, it's really intended for, um, first and foremost, for use and implementation by the chief privacy officer, or the, whoever is the designated privacy official in the organization. Um, but because it is in a NIST document, a, a security document, we know that there is a significant part of the security community that also shares responsibilities for privacy, or in the CIO office, so we knew we had to also write to that audience. Uh, but really it's written first and foremost to a privacy audience, and, um, and that is the, the reason why the document is structured the way it is. It's based on a set of standards called the Fair Information Practice Principles. And um, this was, uh, we, we had the benefit of another parallel activity that was going on, working again with Ron on um, the uh, Federal Enterprise Architecture Security and Privacy Profile. We had been working uh, with Ron and Scott Bernard to try to embed a set of privacy control families in that high level document based on the Fair Information Practice Principles. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But um, so we had we leveraged that work and we basically came up with a set of eight privacy control families. Originally, um, I, it was my understanding that, that in an earlier draft of the FAASPP actually had, I think, 17 privacy control families. Oh, did I get the number right? <laughs> chime in because I'm sure you know there's been very this you know several iterations of that document but again we took well, that was part of a starting point because we said well you know that's a lot for the privacy community we're used to a much smaller set of standard you know principles based on this so we came up with eight and um, and leveraged that work in developing uh, you know, the what is now appendix J uh, we also at the time had the benefit that we were working on something called an Elements of a Federal Privacy Program white paper, which was published in 2010. So that was another opportunity that we had where we were really documenting the day-to-day -day workings of a privacy office, what would be um, an ideal privacy program. And uh, so we leveraged that information and, and used that in the drafting process. Throughout the drafting process, too, we were in consultation with Ron and his team, uh, particularly Erica McAllister, uh, because we wanted to make sure that what we were writing was in the right framework, made sense. Um, we've learned a lot about, you know, writing for a NIST publication. Um, and we also had to go through our own internal community vetting process because documents get generated in our subcommittees. They go to a full privacy committee review 
uh, co-chair review, um, and they're put out there. So all agencies get a bite at the apple. Right. So the privacy uh, committee is actually one of the um, five subcommittees of the full CIO Council, the federal CIO Council. And so the privacy committee has, just like all the other big committees like ICAM and all the other ones, they have a set of subcommittees that, that focus in different areas. Um, Rowan is now uh, one of the co-chairs of the best practices. And, and as I said, uh, Kathy Harmon Stokes, who's out there, is one of the co-chairs of one of the other, um, the Innovation and Emerging Technology subcommittee. Um, and so the way that the, the committee structure has generally worked over time is, you know, it's a, it, each one develops its own products. And just like all the other ones, there's a lot of interagency circulation because the members of those subcommittees are, are interagency, um, and then it goes before the full, the full you know privacy committee, and the privacy committee is is, is comprised of senior privacy officials from across the federal sector, um, and it's also going out through sort of the staffs of those folks who are maybe working on some of the subcommittees, um, and then it it, it kind of comes back. A lot of edits and changes are made based on all that feedback, and then it, it you know goes through another sort of clearance round of circulation, which is then done by sort of a, a core group, which is actually just a group of all the subcommittee chairs and the committee head. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, you know, forward it into the full CIO council when it's issued. And, and so we're, you know, in this case it was a little different because actually NIST was doing the issuing, and so we went into the NIST process for issuance and went out for public comment, not right. everything. Right. The exactly. committee does goes out for full public comment, but it, this it's, was it's a, a fairly... Animal. Um, so this is a very widely circulated document, uh, I mean, at least in its drafting and c creation phase. It was, it was um, very widely you know, fully vetted before yeah. it even went out for public comment. That's top of my mind. And uh, yeah, so that was a new twist for us is that we had to now real and, and you know, uh, realize that once we finished our work and handed it off to NIST, it becomes a NIST uh, publication. Uh, but we still, um, are working very closely with Ron and his team. Uh, as Jonathan said, the document went out in July for public comment. Um, comments were received by early September. And from what I understand, uh, we got few comments compared to typical NIST publications. I think a little in, under 200 comments on the document. Um, now, that may not sound a lot to Ron, but it's a lot to my co-chair and I, Martha Landisberg, of the DHS Privacy Office, because some of these comments are very long. Uh, and they have lots of recommendations and thoughts embedded within just one comment, so you have to sort of sift through everything, try to put them in the right bucket. So we've been working very closely with Ron and Erica on reviewing these and, and doing that careful uh, sifting of the comments and trying to really understand what it is they really were trying to tell us here. Um, there was a lot of good uh, catches, you know, from the typos to, you know, if you just tweak the word a little bit, you're going to get your point across a lot. More clearly, um, and then there were some, you know, some people who were like, "Why are you doing this?" And other people were like, "Well, why don't you just embed it within the core security controls?" But you know, I know Ron's going to be speaking uh, this afternoon. Um, you know, this this idea of merging the two, I think, is, is really key to to you know understand that you know we didn't want this to be just another family of security. Privacy has its own set of requirements. Security being only one of them. And so it was really important, I think, to keep them distinct and show that respect for the two disciplines and the two sets of principles. Mm -hmm. The uh, eight families that you um, talked about, is that for revision two, revision three, or revision four that's going to come out, or yeah. are those revision three? I'll let Roger have any time, but really it's, it's for Rev four. Um, for Rev four. And um, as you all know, you know, Ron Nist called out for, uh, I guess, informal comments on on the current 853 publication and, and preparation and issue in a Rev 4. Um, but then, because we had this part of, the, and this is intended to be you know, an appendix, an appendix, because it was in this development process and ready to go out, uh, I guess you know, the thinking was go ahead and let's get this uh, appendix J released and start getting that feedback. So uh, I think the thinking is once uh, the, the initial public draft of the Rev 4 goes out, this actually would be going out for a second iteration. Will it be an appendix to your report? Yes. That will, okay. Yes. So it will be at some family. Hello, Noah. Yeah. We all know that there's, a, there's a, at least a somewhat of a flip to bring your own device, you know, your own mobile device, or even your own laptop. And it seems to me that that offers an opportunity 
both good and bad, but I'm going to talk about the bad part in terms of privacy for data that we would consider to be PII data to all migrating to people's uh, uh, contact lists and, and uh, you know, so, so have you guys dealt with that? You, you, you know, it's, uh, have you dealt with that? At a specific level, no. no. And this, but I think this is a good opportunity to segue to, you know, what is in this document, you know, at a high level, what it, what is it covering, and what it, what it does and doesn't do. Um, you know, I mentioned the fair information practice principles. Um, as you're familiar with them, you know that, that these are principles that are embedded in the Privacy Act of 1974. You'll see it if you undergo the PIA process. These questions are based on the FIPS. Um, it's an international set of standards um, that, that you know globally recognized. So uh, the, the control families basically um, start with the principle of transparency, um, and which includes you know providing notice to individuals, um, making sure program information is being disseminated to the public, uh, individual participation and redress. Uh, that's ensuring that you are getting consent from individuals, giving them some sense of control about the use of their data, um, giving them and abiding by the right for individuals to have access to their records, which go into the Privacy Act, um, and uh, even complaint management. There is a requirement that agencies have to uh, permit, have a mechanism for receiving complaints, whether internally or from external parties, about your privacy operations. Um, authority and purpose before you do anything. We know you have to know what your authority is to do any kind of collection of PII, particularly sensitive PII, um, and, and be very clear about what the purposes are about around that collection. Uh, data minimization and retention. We all know what that means. Only collect what you need and only retain what you need. And we know in agencies today, uh, yeah, I mean, that's well. like the most popular idea. <laughs> right. You should only collect the little bit and yeah, only keep it for as long as you need to. I mean, People love that. But you know, in the day of in the, the age of e-discovery and, and everything else, and FOIA getting the world's getting a lot more complicated for agencies. So uh, it really is important. And the, the whole record retention, record management, disposal area is exploding. I know at my agency, it's always been out there. It's always been an important driver. But even more so, um, uh, we have to be vigilant. And so it's the, the principle and the controls are there around that. Um, Use limitation. Can I talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, use limitation, the idea of, of internal use, um, sort of principles there, and, and then sort of principles of use limitations when you're going outside the agency, um, and then of course just sort of within the design of how the data is being used and, and, and sort of limits on that and sort of you know, migrations across and things like that. Uh, you know, I mean, limits on use are are, are kind of core. In privacy, um, this is this gets to one of the the, 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 the deep, deep, deep concerns that uh, privacy offices and privacy folks have about collections of personal information. Because the idea um, for most, you know, folks in our spaces is that it really, really, really needs to be specific and it really, really, really needs to be limited to the absolute minimum. Um, that's kind of hard a lot of times for program managers. Because sometimes, you know, over time, as we all know, data becomes useful for lots of other purposes, or it could be useful for other purposes. Um, and, and so, you know, the way that these privacy principles work is they all sort of work together. And so, you know, then that becomes an issue of providing more notice that you're about to do that, and giving people the chance to sort of go, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, so, you know, this is a really critical control. Sorry, I have a quick question. Um, how does this big picture involve, does this integrate the Electronic Communications Privacy Act? Does it, does it talk about that at all? <laughs> no, it's not that specific. It's, okay. It, what, it, things like that, that you know, law, HIPAA, GLBA, and others that might apply to agencies, uh, law or enforcement, national security, um, very specific targeted laws like that, mm -hmm. you would need to take into consideration uh, in impl apply. implementing these controls uh, because you, there may be certain exceptions or exemptions. Um, but the point would be in terms of looking at the controls um, that as you're building, designing, you would have considered that sort of one of your key authorities or you and know, sort of dotted your right, you know, documented that, oh, okay, so this is how we're going through this. Sure. Because ECPA is. It's behind. It's over 20, you know, it's oh, yeah. the last I mean, 27 years old. So which, 
Well, the Privacy Act. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're used yeah. to that. Right. So the Privacy Act, the Privacy Act is even older, but right. yeah, and some of the privacy laws are, are even older than those. Okay, but it's a it's a different. It would be you would have to take it into consideration based on your unique agency, you know, your unique mission. What are things that above and beyond this uh, you also be, need to be considerate of, and how will you, you know, can you implement the control based on these other requirements? Uh, you know, again. Law enforcement, national security comes to mind. Those, but right, specific right. right. So you know there are data protection laws, and then there are data protection laws that provide very specified mm -hmm. access, which is kind of like how that works. Um, you know, you would have to take that into consideration when designing anything and how you would push. Who's right. working on? I know uh, who's working on updating that because last year was the legislative executive mm -hmm. made up all of all the law enforcement community, <laughs> and then the digital due process coalition. Microsoft, Google, Center for Democracy and Technology, and there's two um, different areas that they're working on it, but the fact that law hasn't caught up to technology, obviously it's all baked into the privacy rights and everything else, but I just don't know. My big question was I didn't know if it was integrated into the fair information practice principle, but you're saying it's looked at separately. So if you look at the principles at this level, yeah. the 8,000-foot the 8, level, yeah. so there's a, hundreds of, of laws underneath either that cover specific categories of data. Like HIPAA is a, a great, people always think of HIPAA, actually, the privacy rule is actually just a regulation, but I mean, it, you know, it, it's, sure. and then there's Grand Rouge Biley Act, which covers a lot of financial services information, mm -hmm. and there's several of them, I mean, that, that are very, very restrictive to certain categories, such as tax, and you know, there's tons of them. And then there are certain kinds of, of, of laws which prescribe uh, certain access to information, so they're actually really not thought of best as privacy law, they're actually thought of as special authorities that deal with sort of cutting through privacy laws, but in a very okay. narrow way, you sort of have like the Bank Secrecy Act, and a lot of those act which gives like a very narrow band of, of universal access, but for, for a very, very narrow specified purpose, and not other purposes, so there's a particular <coughs> privacy twist around it. Um, both of, all of that exists sort of under the high level price, so the high level principles. So the principles would be how you would design the program that you would sort of deal with the multiple authorities, how they fit together, because not every agency sort of even right. has data that would be subject in a certain way, you know, that you know you would ever trigger one of those sure. unique, unique laws. Okay. Um, if, for example, and so you would uh, these would be the high-level principles. You'd look at everything, and then you might say, except for this little band of information, because that's covered by, you know, this specific authority, and these specific people get access to it because of this specific law enforcement of unique authority. Sure. You know, it would be how you would document, and you would, in theory, and this is where the privacy office comes in, would help map those authorities to that particular activity, and that's the collaboration. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, and obviously, you know, does that particular law? Because in this case, we're looking at internal agency operations. It's one of the first impact of this. So, um, what does it even apply to agencies? And we know HIPAA does. HIPAA applies to certain agencies, but not all. Yeah. So, can, can I say right off my question? And I can understand why you haven't dealt with it. Why my question in any in what you're doing in any detail way? Do you think in the Eight principles that you've talked about that there's enough information or, or understanding that you can kind of take what you did and go and apply it to this whole yes. in, in, in the personal devices doing government data? Yes. And, and the reason why, and, and I mean, I do, I feel like well, and it was intended to be uh, to give you a framework you know, through which you would look at those kind of initiatives. Um, and typically the discussion around those activities is, the, you know, the security side. If, you know, if there's going to be PI data on that, right. what, you know, how is it going to be locked down, especially if it's, it's a government record. But um, we want you to think through the whole, you know, set of control families. There may be other issue areas that have not been thought about. Do you have a transparency, a public notice issue? Do you have a, a, a data integrity and accuracy issue? that just force you to go through, um, do you need to come up with a specific privacy policy just around that particular initiative? 
uh, you know, for the first time, because we'll be part of a, a key security publication, we're hoping to, uh, as Jonathan said earlier, demystify what privacy means right. and all of the things that you should think about. It doesn't give the solution to every granular initiative or situation, but at least it gives you some, a starting point and you could go through this and like, okay, have we thought about this? Have we made sure we have the correct authorities to do any collection if that were the case? Um, and again, we know we know the privacy folks know what to go and do in this regard, but we know we're also speaking to a much broader community of people that may not understand what are all the, uh, the, the range of considerations when you're trying to protect privacy in the federal And it's space. important, you know, and I'm sure you, everybody knows this by now, that neither privacy nor security are the only two issues right. that need to be discussed yeah. in this space. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, personal mobile devices in particular, you've got a whole raft of issues from all different kinds of, you know, issues. I mean, I'm, you know, lawyers working on litigation would be concerned about e discovery and how you do e discovery of your personal mobile device if it's not part of the enterprise. And, you know, you're going to have a raft of issues. And, and with many of the things, at least in my experience, the key has always been getting people to come together to, to, to explore before you sort of develop a, a complete plan. I mean, you can't sort of say, this is the way we're going to do it and not have it, have it analyzed a lot of thoughts in your structure completely. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it, but you're right. I mean, I do think at a principle level, yes, this is, is, is the roadmap you take for addressing the privacy issues. Does that mean you've addressed everything? No, um, because there's too many other things out yeah, there that are particles. But I do think that this will be the proper framework to use to address even mobile in privacy. And a key reason why this document, we see it just a great resource and a way to empower people, because privacy people, there are not that many of us in the government today, it's a growing field, but uh, we can't be in every meeting, every place where a decision is being made, where you know a seat for a new system or business process is being born. So we're hoping that this will help to empower folks to have that conversation with themselves. We hope it'll be you know, uh, we hope it will encourage them to reach out to the privacy official, and now you'll know why the privacy person is asking all these questions, because they have embedded in their minds, tattooed on their brains, this, the Fair Information Practice Principles, and this set of, and their own unique requirements for the agency. You know, I'm, you know Privacy Act applies to everybody, E-Government Act applies to everybody, but you may have other unique requirements, uh, you know, uh, that your agency has to meet. So, the privacy person is trying to do that assessment, and, and, and okay, what of all these things has to be done in order for you to launch that initiative successfully. And a lot of times, just like on the security side of the house, as you know, um, you're playing catch up, so you have to do that assessment and analysis really fast. <laughs> and people want instant uh, you know, determinations, uh, but you might, for example, uh, have to update, if not create, a, a system of records notice, a Privacy Act notice. And at our agency, because that notice has to be approved by the FDIC Board of Directors, we tell people allow anywhere from six to eight months to get something like that done. Even though our CIO serves as our chief privacy officer, he does not have the authority to just publish it. He can approve them, he can make sure they get written, but he can't put it and send it to the Federal Register. So if you're developing a new initiative and you've got a SORN issue, you can see how much lead time you have to build in to, to address that. I'll tell you, the project guys really don't like to hear about that. but. That's what we're there to tell them and then help develop a strategy about how they're going to achieve that um, in a successful production. Successful and worse than that. I'm still working on an update for my SORN in, in two years. Well, you get, well sometimes SORN can take out. a long time no, a, just to get the thing this, done. This is just an update for that. Well, and you have to board of directors deal with that's pretty amazing. System of records yeah. notice. So yeah. under the it's Privacy Act, the um, under the Privacy mm -hmm. Act, you're required to publish a notice um, of a system of records. Um, when you're going to do a collection on individuals and you're going to retrieve and pull and disclose and share, sort of like it's it's the document that governs what you're going to do with a grouping of records that contain personal information that uses it and that you're, you're sort of organizing it by that data. Um, and there's a, a required federal register publication. So one of the things that's very difficult about it, and this goes to a lot of other documents, is you know there's there's, there's this one piece. It has to go out through that very formalistic process and it's got, you know, sort of this public comment period where you have to wait and then, and then you may have to respond to things that are coming through that. Yeah, controversial your issue right. depends on the controversy level of your issue. So, um, 
the end of the day, obviously, it provides a framework for how we handle and deal with products and information within our agency. Mm -hmm. If the intent is to take that now and actually get more specific and granular, in, excuse me, granular in terms of things like some, what I'm seeing mm -hmm. in the industry, especially in the federal space, we're putting too many systems on there somewhere. And then you begin to lose sight of yeah. how many systems, Excellent. what the mission is, yeah. and does that someone represent that? You want to say, is there any thinking as a future version of Next Day comes out, mm -hmm. we get more specific in terms of how can we do TIAs, how can we do someone, how can we update them, how many systems can go on there, and things of that nature. Because as a system, it's driving me crazy to see this. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we have several systems that are more so obviously we're on with look in the day, but I guess it's the direction that we're headed that way. Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, right now, we weren't contemplating going to a specific guidance around that. I mean, the, the Privacy Act and OMB regulation both require you to do a like, biannual storm review to look at things like that. And and, and, and I understand we, we definitely have system records notices that cover a lot of business processes and a lot of systems. Part of that's born of the fact that it takes so long to get a sworn approved and published, so we try to fit a lot in there because we, we don't have the luxury of being able to just amend it and republish it every month, every quarter. Um, you know, we're lucky to get a package done a year, but we definitely do it for biannual review every two years. Um, I think really it's great that you're engaged on that and you're concerned about it and that you bug the privacy folks that USDA about that. Uh, <laughs> one of the eight. Well, that's good. Um, and that you're aware of that because if it's not giving you the cover that you need, you feel like you can't defend with your IG or the public that and, and make clear this is addressing the system. And they don't. The system records notices don't typically say the specific systems that are addressed. Although right. it, it depends on the agency, ours don't. It's right. very high level. It has very right. And I mean, part of the, the, the problem you're talking yeah. about is sort of the, the schism and the confusion, at least now, I think, down the road, where the Privacy Act system of records really has, it has nothing to do with IT. It, has, it, it can exist and often, mm -hmm. the Privacy Act was written in the mid 70s, so it was written at a time conceptually, mentally, it's all written around the idea of a file cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, and it made total sense at the time. It made total sense. It doesn't make sense anymore. And it's one of those things, you know, like, uh, I mean, there's legislative proposals that's sitting on the Hill that's been introduced by Senator Akaka to really radically um, rewrite the Privacy Act and, and the Government Act with respect to privacy authorities and really kind of deal with the problem you're talking about because what, what you're talking about would not be legal under the Privacy Act, mm -hmm. under Senator Akaka. But as a matter of best practices, I think you are unconditionally correct. Um, that agencies should try um, as best as they can when things are really very different in terms of business purpose and business usage. Those really um, ought to be broken apart um, as separate systems of records notices because what's going on is so different. Yeah, and, um, and the descriptions that are required in the notice is sort of the authorities to collect and, and purposes behind it. If that just starts to become to seem sort of incomprehensible gibberish, then you're not really providing the transparency and notice, which is what that whole thing is designed for. And that's, to me, as a chief privacy officer, when you want to start to try to break these things apart. So some of the things that come about, you know, as a system, we have to worry about data extraction. People want data from our database. And right. We actually have to use those steps to measure on how much data you actually need, not want. Right. And you need, can you identify it? You can identify it. Um, but secondly, database on population, right? You got 50 databases. Looking at, do I need 50 databases? And uh, do I have people names across 10 instances of those databases? And I really don't need 10 databases with people's names, and I really only need one. So again, taking that framework and looking at the future, and I'm a straight IT guy learning privacy. Okay. I'm not a I hire a privacy guy to keep learning IT. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Well, what I'm finding is that they had not merged yet. Like right. they're merging. They're merging, but they haven't they're full of merge. So I wasn't able to find the true privacy guy or person, if you will, with the IT. No IT with the true privacy. So we're teaching him privacy, they're teaching us, or we're teaching IT, they're teaching us privacy. But getting back to that framework, now we have that framework with intent moving forward that we really want to get granular, talk about data extractions and, and 
database and how they view it and how we handle PI within the electronic home address. I think that's certainly something to take into account for future iterations. I think right now we're tasked with just, you know, this is the first shot over the bow, just to try to document a core set of controls and, and a baseline of your information practice principles. It, it is not, you know, it's not going to cover every privacy issue under the sun. It's pretty broad and it's pretty comprehensive, but it's not going to address every uh, situation. But, and then we, the next uh, task will be to come up, I guess, with test, uh, test procedures around this. So, but I do think that's a really good. I think it's one time as you consolidate. One time, absolutely no reason to pull them all together into just because you're merging all the data. But you know, you have to you know cut down on the number of systems. Does not mean you need to have fewer storms. Again, the two aren't per se related. Yeah. So exactly. you can have. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, my previous agency, at Social Security. I mean, our, at our high level, you know, big level systems, we only really had a team. But I mean, in terms of systems of records notices, we were in well over 100. So I mean, because the business purposes were all over the place until you had separate SORNs for each of those. And that is, not only is it okay, I mean, to me it's, it's better for the public, and it's actually better for the agency because things are, at least down the road in terms of managing the data usage, it's very, very clear what's authorized in it. I think as a comment to the gentleman in the front, uh, here at CISO, one thing to be cautious about, don't see privacy as a function of security. Because our EU brethren, they use them as two separate frameworks. Here in the States, we use security to achieve privacy. But they are two separate animals. And as a CISO, it's going to be very uh, attractive to you to try to consolidate all these type of functions in the security shop. And it should not be. And kind of related to that, yeah, we do. Curious if they, you thought about guidance to put out to help people, systems and agencies understand which of these and how they kind of apply to the system versus the agency. Because I've had some conversations that they consider the import privacy is already done because they got so much. But they've got you look at the system. Yeah, and so, the like, system. you know, how would it apply in the different? Or a CNA or something like that, yeah. trying to merge the two statements of record. So, I was going to say, I love those comments. And, and I was going to say, it's very, it's very refreshing to hear them um, as you know, someone who's definitely not an IT expert. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer by training, and I've been in privacy for years. Um, Barbara Simon's training. Okay. 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 It's good, it's good to hear, but I mean, the good. The good concept with that is it's it's good to keep them separate because you you've got other considerations in both you know both disciplines at issue um, and they're not the same thing they overlap and they have a wonderful relationship and certainly one helps drive the other both ways but they're not the same thing. But and without doing fine. some of that consolidation, we also open ourselves up for duplication and get yeah, ourselves so out the same. Okay. We definitely have to work together. We have to be key partners. So I would, I would agree with the gentleman um, suggesting as far as it doesn't have to be on security, but it doesn't necessarily say that um, it can't be either. What I'm finding is that if it stands out on its own, there's so many considerations that we're not considering as of yet from an IT perspective, as we talked about, extraction, data at rest. What's wrong with developing systems and applications? Are uh, the privacy considerations that go into the SDLC? Mm -hmm. Somebody from an IT, from IT background, I think, really has to be engaged with the privacy folks and say, "Here's what a web service is. Here's what a database is. Here's what a database is. <laughs> <laughs> so they're about to go through the same issues that security had with IT when exactly. trying to get it built. I mean, as someone who's who's privacy for you know. We're under the CIO, who's our CPO, I report to the CISO, our program reports to CISO, um, and you know that was a new experience for me, but definitely I see the advantages, obviously, of being able to have direct access to all the IT project managers, the security side, enterprise architecture, all that fall within the domain of the CIO office, and, and, they, and because we're there, they feel very comfortable coming and asking and having that dialogue and allowing us to have this kind of back and forth, let's hatch out all the issues, um, there are more than you thought, or maybe not as many as you thought. You know, good news for you. Uh, but we do have a challenge, and we we don't have a recommendation. And as we did uh, the elements of the federal uh, the elements of the federal privacy program in that paper, we did not say where the privacy program should reside and who should have ownership of it. 
because every agency seems to be different. Sometimes it's in the general counsel office. We're seeing more of a trend to have standalone privacy offices. A lot are in the CIA office. That's where a lot of resources are. A lot with security, and security is within the CIO office or sometimes standalone. Um, it was just too difficult to say you shall have a program here. But no matter where it is, obviously that dialogue has to happen, and this document hopefully will help to forge and, yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, and that's one of the key things. Yeah. Like the goal of the document was was to foster the dialogue. So there were multiple goals that were needed. One was to foster and make the dialogue easier, to break down the barriers that exist between the communities, um, simply because you know privacy folks are all over this place. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes folks don't even know who they are, and sometimes the privacy functions themselves are split. That's certainly That's the condition where I am at Commerce, where you know not everything is all yet consolidated in my office as the chief privacy office. My office is new, and so you know I'm still in the process of sort of collecting at the department level and organizing the authorities. And that's something I'm working on. And as that happens, you know, it, it's as you're working with disparate parts to even accomplish your functions. You, this type of thing is a wonderful roadmap to help you build. So you have that as a roadmap, you have that as a guide to help if you're in a, a more developed organization in terms of the privacy program, you know, to help, you know, use that conversation and help use that do document as something to sort of say, here's what we need to do. And it's also really good when if you're in a small function and you don't have enough resources to get into everything, that at least the controls themselves are documented so there's something which is usually better than nothing. Um, even if not implemented the way you would in your ideal world, there's at least something there that folks are like, okay, I have to do something that deals with this and that explains what they are so I can at least get something in there that sort of governs that or it might even cause questions to start to filter out. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's... <laughs> de-identified information to becoming identifiable information is almost impossible to do. And one of the reasons is because it's not static. So what was not, what is de-identified today, in six months probably will be identifiable and therefore PII. Because what's going on outside of sort of the, the, the discussion you're, you want to have, <coughs> at least with that specific issue, is not, is changing more and more information coming out there that can be tied together and suddenly become identifiable. The classic example of that is what happened with Netflix. It's released all kinds of information about trends 
and it became something that could be matched against other data sets that were released as well, where suddenly they could figure out who was renting what movie. Netflix never did that. I mean, they, and I'm picking on them, but it's not even their fault because that wasn't even their intent when they were doing that. They were trying to actually provide useful information about sort of things. I mean, they had no intent, and there was no evidence at the time that it was going to happen. But because other people were like, other data sets at, at the time, I mean, nobody saw it coming. But people saw it coming, I guess, at a high level, but not specifically with respect to Netflix video rental data. And all of a sudden, it would become that where you could peg down to the level of, I know what you rented last night. So who's going to develop the floor and the bottom of the spin? Because that's where this goes, right? right? I mean, you've got all this data that's, that's coming about, and you match two, three, four segments of it. Now all of a sudden you have a PII record that somebody else has maintained all the information that's out in the public. So, we call it Nexus Lexus. Who puts the floor? Yes. <laughs> 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 that's right. That's right. Well, I think, you know, what we would just ask, no matter what the initiative is, you just go back to the basics, whether it's data aggregation, I mean, the big thing around our agency these days is data warehousing, data marts, which just, you know, uh, the sound of it is, is pretty terrifying when you talk about taking everything we have and putting it in one place. I get the, I get the business process advantage. I get the fact that it makes, you know, us more effective in an agency, but when you have maybe... 10 sets of data that have their own distinct rules based on certain laws and regs and policies and now you want to put that all in one place for more users to use. I mean, you have to go back to the basics. Do, is that authorized? How, you know, it, it, what are the complicating factors before you do that kind of aggregation just internally and allow, you know, new users to, to access that data? So we just want to force a conversation back based on the principles. So back to the mm -hmm. appendix, would this deal with aggregation, would it deal with scraping, would it deal with sort of these other issues like CUI and all these things. Not at the specific that it talks about CUI or talks about the issue of scraping or, you know, which by the way sounds awfully scary to me and always has. <laughs> but, you know, an aggregation and things like that because does it deal with it conceptually as a framework which is very similar to the to the mobile point we raised? Yes, it does. It does because when you talk about aggregation or, or, or scraping, do you have the authority in to leave, and then this is getting to the legal authority. Do you have the legal authority to mix that data or not? Mm -hmm. And you know that's a, that's a yes or no question. Either the authority is there or the authority is not there. And in some cases, the authority is not there. So can you do it? Well, if you were analyzing and using these controls, the answer would be no. You cannot. Why? Because it is specifically not allowed. Okay. So you you know so that's one of the advantages of this is we tried to put these down in a way that people would have access to this information in a way. Folks, you know, are you able to use it? You know, in terms of, I want to give um, Office X um, uses this data and collected it for this purpose and all this stuff. Now Office Y needs it. Well, can they have it? You know, there's a whole section on internal uses and then information sharing and, and how does that work? I thought yeah, back back way from all that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so I do have one more question. All right. So I definitely get that. It really is very difficult to delineate what is PI and what isn't. But is there going to be some in the near future or some thought about categorizing the different types? Like IAP has SPI or SPI and the PI. We have the federal government hasn't really adopted SPI. And I'll give you an example. It used to be PI was person, um, bank number, routing number, anything that we represent the person's identity. But now what we're finding is, especially in the conservation agency, there's other things that could be considered PI. Mm -hmm. Where the farmer lives, mm -hmm. where have they received money, that long of their, uh, of, their, of their land, acreage of their land, what practice are they applying on that land to grow their crop? All of which is considered PI putting together. But it's not a typical in the sense of my identity, if you will. And I guess, and I guess my question is, is there some initiative, has there been any thought about categorizing the different types. If we can't delineate what they right. are, can we categorize four or five different types of settings fall in this bucket? Well, I think you just underscore why we didn't try to tackle yeah. one common <laughs> definition of PII. Every agency is unique. Uh, what you consider sensitive PII, I mean, we, we, we do obviously acknowledge OMB's definition. Um, obviously, the Privacy Act has a certain definition for a record and you know, what constitutes a Privacy Act record. 
but trying to come up with some common definition that can be applied to all of our unique agencies and situations would be impossible. So you have to tailor this to your own situation. Um, I'm not saying it's not a, a, a lofty goal, but a good goal. But I think she does very give difficult. enough there because I've, been, I've done that for my system, is actually gone in and said, this is the type of PI we have and categorized you know, for right. my system. And said, this stuff over here, we could care less because it's publicly available. Because we'll use a bit. Okay. At least you can build a security yeah. classification yeah. guide around it. Well, one thing I would caution the agencies, because I know you know you develop these data families. And what I would recommend, though, is make sure that you are continually reviewing those data families. Because um, the people that develop those families may not necessarily come from a privacy perspective and I went through a review of ours and I'm like why does that say that's low sensitivity <laughs> that's high sensitive you have to make sure you're constantly looking at these things um, to make sure they are up to date and, and reflect the current situation the current environment and, and another thing you have to and this kind of goes to, to Rowan's last comment but it, it's also a, a very important point which is I'm not a big, actually, I can't stand the term PII, and I've never liked it, and it's not, it's actually not used in the Privacy Act or the e-government act. It's, it's, it's not. It, it's a term that just sort of came around, um, and it's actually not used outside of the United States. Um, the, the term in other countries is, is personal data. Um, and everybody else but us uses that term. Um, it actually goes back to home being home. Right, and I mean, we all know that, that the OMB memo started using it, but when OMB memo used it, there were other people using it, but it, it was this sort of a categorical, but in, in, I guess over time to me, the debate has like almost turned itself around where I was having an, uh, a, a very detailed conversation with, with someone, and they said, but, but employee names, not PII. I said, just stop. I was like, what did you just say? You know, right. I, I was like, it's a name. Of course it's personally identifiable. <laughs> <laughs> it's a name. Um, yeah, it's a name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not me personal. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it, it, it got to the point of where, I mean, it really has, so I mean, the, if you're going to talk to a privacy yes. person about it, it's going to be a lot less important about whether it's PII or not PII and whether or not it's worthy of protection, or is it not something that needs to be protected, which is much more of the sensitive, not sensitive discussion. Well, and I think the SPII came about, and I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but it was, it was an OMB memo, one of the 615 or 616, um, and you really had to make sure you were you know, classifying the data and, and categorizing your systems in accordance with the right uh, sensitivity level, because that was going to cost the agency money. You know, a low or moderate or high rated system makes all the difference. So agencies needed some well, way to... right after all the VA regions. Right? Exactly. Right. So you yeah. had to have a way to sift through and know which ones belong in that high cost category versus, you know, the ones that you don't have to worry about. You always have to look at the context, too, even if it's just a list of names. So some lists of names matter and some lists of names list of air marshals. Yeah. So um, was there ever a thought then to take those two ideas. In other words, privacy kind of goes hand in hand with confidential information around the corporations. And there's a whole lot of reasons why I think there's a lot of push toward privacy being more inclusive. Mm -hmm. PII really kind of strikes at the heart of us as Americans being personal people with personal rights and personal you know, ownership of our personal information. <coughs> So if the thought really did ever get down to sort of its core of kind of striking those two as sort of separate discussions, I think you'd probably garner a lot more widespread support more quickly, especially on Capitol Hill with respect to ideas around privacy. I think oftentimes it gets a little cloudy mm -hmm. with private meaning confidential versus personal meaning my child's uh, you know, health care record specifically their age My and their, right and their social security number. Um, I think the gentleman over here that's speaking about uh, mobility and certainly we'll talk more about this later, that if you don't even begin to I don't think anyone in this room can begin to comprehend <coughs> the level of private information that is being currently captured on these mobile devices and without our knowledge. So, well, yeah, the end the of that, I mean, it's not even, it's like, it's there was recently a, mind just numbing. this week, just this week, there was an article yeah. that came out about there's, there's a company that's capturing just a huge amount that has been buried in the operating system. 
Yeah, uh, it's Carrier IQ. Carrier IQ. So, so I don't. So turn your phones off. When the issue came to light, what I went back to was the FIPS. Where was the notice? Did they have a notice? In fact, that's one of the debates. Who was responsible for the notification? Was it the carrier? Was it the name, the firm the itself? Uh, so, and there was so one other party. Who had to give the notice? That you and you knew. Okay, well, I so turn on this so, phone. So John, and, well, today your staff might be one, right? It's maybe my staff is me, right? Right. So, <laughs> so right, and, it, and I, just, I get that. And in a lot of agencies, that's the way that it is. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of just a, a reuse of information. We use this in our mobile uh, world. So the Center for Disease Control began to collect data on mobile phone uh, as the only phone in a house because uh, they, had, um, they had to follow up with people. And so the CDC began to track how many people no longer had a phone line to their home because it became impossible to kind of contact them. And they just began to collect the data. Our industry, the cellular industry, uses that as people are migrating to cell phones. And of course, when we cite the data, of course, nobody ever cites it because you have to cite the CDC, which then people say, oh, God, cell phones yeah, aren't safe. Are yeah. OK? So, so like, I went, right? Because it's the center for disease control that's tracking how many people are using cell phones. Using cell phones. Using cell phones. Using cell phones. So this really strikes the heart of what we're talking about in terms of this reuse and misuse or kind of the... We call it dual use. Dual use, correct. But it, you know, I just, I just want you to be aware that while you as government agencies are sort of in here thinking about this collection of information and what you publish then, it's often used by industry much differently than you intended it and certainly in ways to our advantage. So. Was that a <laughs> <laughs> It is. I'll gladly be transparent. I think we are... Uh, oh, there's a time for these. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are going under Any closing remarks? Or no, I mean, I, I'm glad we were able to, to have the discussion. I, I actually thought we were really glad to see everybody engage on it. I know, and, and Ron's here too, and he was a, certainly, as Ryan said at the beginning, a key partner in you know, making this the, the appendix happen. But one of the things I see it already just by the discussion we had today, it is going to help in our goal of sort of demystifying the discussion a lot back and forth between the two communities. It was happening on its own, I thought, but I think that this is really going to help be sort of the document in between the set of controls, which is actually what we were, we're shooting for. Um, you have educated the IGs on this, so they're not going to use this as a stick to be done. Well, we and actually, I'm going to get to that point, which is, <laughs> of course this was actually is designed, that you. was <laughs> one of our goals, which was, and instead of having different different sets, and I've been personally at the end of this, and I know several other you folks, do. and I hate to leave this delightfully juicy kernel on the table, <laughs> but I know everybody has been at the back end of an audit where privacy came up, and it was talked about in some kind of weird way where there was like, what? And even the privacy folks were like, wait, wait. Um, one idea was is at least there'd be something standard where everybody would know where they're going. You know, this would be a set of published controls where at least there's a baseline of discussion, including the auditors, because the IG community, the GAO community, they also need that. And a lot of these things, agencies should already be doing anyway. Right. So we want you to. Um, ask, I, yeah. You know, I mentioned good new programs need a roadmap. Um, you know, old programs need better dialogue tools. Um, you know, again, the idea of empowering everybody to do it. Um, you know, this is this is. This I think, is a really I think this thing. is a great move, and it's an idea like in the security world, getting stuff from behind the green door back into yeah. the security offices and kind of out of the compartment world. This is taking it out of the legal world, getting it away from the attorneys and getting it back into the masses. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Sure you feel that way, okay? Thank you. You're going to be late to your own session.